From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The Supreme Court issues two big rulings reining in the administrative state, including one that abolishes a judicial doctrine known as Chevron deference. Plus, a unanimous ruling by the justices puts on hold, at least for now, Texas and Florida laws regulating social media websites. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnists Kim Strassel and Alicia Finley. As we round out this year's decisions in a jam-packed Supreme Court term, let's take up three cases we haven't had a chance to talk about yet, starting with Loper Bright Enterprises. This is a decision late last week, and here is the holding in the syllabus from the Supreme Court. The Administrative Procedure Act requires courts to exercise their independent judgment in deciding whether an agency has acted within its statutory authority, and courts may not defer to an agency interpretation of the law simply because a statute is ambiguous. Chevron is overruled. Kim, maybe the place to start is, can you give us a reminder of what Chevron deference is, or maybe rather what it was, (laughs) and how big of a deal it is that Chevron deference has now fallen? Hooray! We love that. Past tense. So Chevron is a judicial doctrine. It began in 1984, and it generally holds that when a statute is ambiguous or vague or there's a gap, that judges must defer to regulators because they are the experts. And this came out of a general respect that the judiciary had for the executive branch. It started very much as relying on the executive branch as the experts when it came to facts in some of these statutory or rulemaking processes. But after Chevron, it became a deference to those agencies on questions of the law. And again, it was not even a watershed moment when it first came. A lot of people didn't even recognize it as that big of a court decision or a new doctrine. But what ended up happening, lower courts really started seizing on it. It became this whole formulated two-part test that began to guide every interaction between the judiciary and the executive branch, in particular on rulemaking issues. An entire industry of lawyers grew up around trying to interpret and bring cases based on Chevron deference. It also influenced Congress's actions in that you could easily argue that over the years, Congress has become either lazy on the one hand, it's just become slow and not interested in writing precise statutes. Or I would argue in the case of liberal lawmakers, they purposely leave statutes extremely vague because they know that most of the regulators in Washington, D.C. believe in bigger, tougher rules. And while they might not be able to pass those through Congress, if they just leave holes in the legislation, those bureaucrats will ram mad trucks through it and come up with the most expansive rule possible. So it had become incredibly corrosive. This is a huge victory. We can talk about the specific case that was brought up and the finding of the ruling. But overall, the end of this is remarkable. It's a big win for the separation of powers. It's a big win for putting unelected bureaucrats back in their place. And it's also a big win for average Americans because a lot of these Chevron cases ended up being brought by moneyed interests and very powerful lawyers. And it left all the rest of us uncertain about where our rights were and the stability of the legal system. If you read the dissent by Justice Elena Kagan dissenting on behalf of the three liberal justices, she makes the argument, Alicia, that this is the death of expertise in Washington, D.C. And she provides some examples of Chevron cases. This is one. Under the Endangered Species Act, the Fish and Wildlife Service must designate endangered vertebrate fish or wildlife species, including distinct population segments of those species. And then Justice Elena Kagan asks, what makes one population segment distinct from another? Must the service treat the Washington state population of western gray squirrels as distinct because it is geographically separated from other western gray squirrels? Or can the service take into account that the genetic makeup of the Washington population does not differ markedly from the rest? And Alicia, to my eye, the majority opinion by the Chief Justice John Roberts does a pretty good job responding to this, saying that courts now 
have to make a decision about what the law means by distinct population. But he says that judges don't rule blindly. The parties to the case often bring expertise. There are amicus briefs that bring expertise. And the agencies view of that as the experts on the Endangered Species Act in this example can be given weight by the judge that is deciding the case. The point is that the judge owes the public independent judgment on whether the agency's interpretation, its position, is persuasive or not. And I mean, a couple of responses that might happen as a result of the end of Chevron deference is that Congress, when it writes laws like this, could offer more clarification of what it means by terms such as distinct population. But then also what happens is you could have a trial, you could have a court proceeding where each side brings in its arguments, one side saying that what the law means by distinct is this, one side saying what the law means by distinct is that, and then it's up to the judiciary to make a real decision about the point, the purpose of the law. Well, I think that that's right. And I think that already is happening, actually. What Chevron requires or required was courts not just to pay respect to the agency's interpretations of the law, but also to basically be deferred to them as long as they were, quote unquote, reasonable. And and oftentimes they were very deferential in terms of how they defined reasonable. So as long as they weren't way out in left field, judges would tend to rubber stamp them. They would also tend to defer to agencies on whether even terms were were ambiguous. And this is actually came up in this case in which the Looper Bright Enterprise ruling, and actually there's a second one regarding the same rule, Commerce Department rule regarding fisheries and boats having to pay for government officials to monitor them in off the New England coast. And the First Circuit and the DC Circuit didn't actually apply Chevron the same way. One actually said that while we actually think that the law is unambiguous, and another said, well, we actually think it's somewhat ambiguous, but we think the agency has the authority to do what it did nonetheless. And so what you often have is ping pong, not just between different circuit courts and district courts, but also between different administrations. And what the chief really emphasizes in his opinion is that actually rolling back the Chevron deference will actually provide more certainty, stability to parties that because judges will be according the best interpretation to the law and not just any reasonable one. So regulators can't go back and rewrite laws and exploit putative ambiguities as they do now. And so you may actually have, and as you also pointed out, Congress will legislate just much more clearly. There have been so many cases over the years. I mean, I like to point to the Volcker rule in the Dodd-Frank Act, which was banned proprietary trading. And then the Fed wrote, had to write a thousand page rules to try to define what that is. So you'll actually have Congress actually perhaps doing its job. And then there are a lot of issues that have come up in Congress in recent years where it's kind of punted to the regulatory agencies. For instance, cryptocurrency, AI, stable coins, privacy regulation. That's another big one. But they've essentially deferred to the agencies, and the agencies have then issued regulations. So Congress has never really had an incentive to actually write and debate legislation. Imagine that. Uh, you know, that's what used to happen before Chevron uh, over 100 years ago. And more bills and legislation was actually passed. Hang tight. We'll be right back in a moment. Welcome back. One wrinkle here is that Chevron deference was long defended by conservative jurists, including Justice Antonin Scalia, though I think late Scalia was changing his mind about that and becoming more skeptical. And part of the evolution may be just the context when you were sitting there in the 80s and you had your experience for decades was judges thinking themselves as philosopher kings and coming in and overruling what the political branches were doing, maybe deference looked like a solution. But now we have the opposite experience of regulators run wild. And Kim, the key words to me in the argument Alicia just made is the stability of the law. Because again, to go back to this point that Justice Kagan is making about the Western gray squirrel and whether it's a distinct population because the Washington group lives separately from the rest or whether it has to be genetically distinct, honestly, 
agree. I'm not sure that the answer to that question matters as much as having an answer to that question. And in the absence of Chevron deference, what you would get is a court answering and saying that geographic separation is enough or that geographic separation is not enough. And you have to take in some kind of genetic component to decide whether this is the same species as the group of squirrels that is living over the mountain. But with Chevron deference, what you end up getting is this ping pong back and forth where one administration says that these squirrels are distinct for the Endangered Species Act. The next administration says they aren't. And you don't have any stability in the law. And I think what we need more than anything in many of these cases is an answer. And then if Congress wants to change that and change the definition of what a distinct population is, it is free to do so. But that should not be in the hands of regulators who are not elected and do not have the power to make the law. That's absolutely right. And who are constantly changing as well, too. Look, we've had Chevron deference now for, well, for 40 years. And some of these disputes have been stretching on for 40 years. And that's in addition to, as Alicia noted, even in the case that ended up coming in front of the court this time, you had two different courts that were looking at Chevron in different ways. We shouldn't like the word ambiguity when it comes to the law. There were plenty of other reasons. I mean, stability of the law is a very good reason in and of itself for getting rid of Chevron. And the Chief Justice, John Roberts, made that case in trying to respond to what will ultimately be complaints from outsiders about an overturning of a precedent or a judicial doctrine. But he was noting that stability in the rule of law is precisely why we have stare decisis in the first place, is to try to keep consistency. So getting rid of this is actually the best way to promote stable and consistent rule of law. But the other thing that got brought up in this case, which is is fascinating, and I think it goes back to the point that this was a little bit of an accidental doctrine. It was never meant to become this sweeping thing that it became. But the Chief Justice notes that it was never reconciled as well with the Administrative Procedures Act, which lays out the ways in which agencies are meant to develop regulations, but also also incredibly clearly points out the courts are supposed to be the ultimate arbiters of these kind of rules. The APA was passed back in 1946 as a check on the zeal of the executive branch, and it outright says that the courts, not agencies, will decide all questions of the law. So it was a problem in that regard, too. Somehow, no one had ever reconciled it with the APA, and it clearly runs afoul of it. And then just Justice Thomas also had a nice concurrence opinion saying that not only did he agree with the overturning of this on the basis of the main decision, but he made a pretty striking and powerful argument that this simply violates the separation of powers as well, too, in that it's giving agencies the ability to do jobs that were clearly laid out by Article Three courts. The second ruling on the administrative state came Monday, the last day of the court's term. It is a 6-3 majority. This case is called Corner Post versus the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And it has to do with when regulated parties may sue over regulations that they think are beyond the scope of the agency's authority. Alicia, what did the Supreme Court majority do here? So here at issue was a business that was a North Dakota truck stop that was found in 2018. And it was trying to challenge a rule promulgated under the Dodd-Frank Act, the cap bank interchange cap debit card fees. And the problem here was that the Fed and and lower courts said, no, you can't challenge that. You only had six years to do so under the Administrative Procedure Act. There's a six-year statute of limitation that starts to run when an agency's action is putatively final. And that would have started in 2011 when the regulation was issued. Now, the Supreme Court disagreed and said, well, actually, the shot clock doesn't start to run until a party is actually harmed, first harmed. In this case, that would have been when Corner Post was founded. So it actually has more time to challenge this rule. And the court's ruling would apply across the board to all kinds of agency actions. You know, many of these have already been challenged in court and have been sustained. 
but some of them haven't. And this provides another bite at the apple. Speaking of a parade of horribles, the dissent here is particularly overwrought to my eye, Kim. Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson, writing for the three liberals, says, allowing every new commercial entity to bring fresh facial challenges to long existing regulations is profoundly destabilizing for both government and business. She adds this looping in the Chevron ruling, the tsunami of lawsuits against agencies that the court's holdings in this case and Loper Bright have authorized has the potential to devastate the functioning of the federal government, unquote. And Kim, again, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that view because if regulators are doing their job well and staying within the bounds of the delegations that Congress has given them, staying within the bounds of the law, then they shouldn't have any problem if new businesses are allowed to sue because they should be able to win those cases. Well, not only that, but the argument presupposes that we have stability now. And we just finished going through why, especially with Chevron, you have a constantly shifting environment of regulations and rules and interpretations of them because of changes in the bureaucracy and administration and direction instead of having the law provide clarity. Now, the other reason that this is not a very powerful argument, the suggestion from the dissent that Corner Post is now going to set off this tsunami of lawsuits, that also forgets that companies, even newer ones, they can challenge the rule if an enforcement action is brought against them. So they still have a bite at the apple even past that six years. It's just that they would have to wait to get slapped about. Now, there are going to be some companies that move more proactively, but in doing so will elicit, and this is the idea behind all of this, clarity in the law and a kind of final say and solve some of these issues. And this is also just, I mean, again, one of the things that's frustrating about these dissents is they spend so much time talking about the supposed pragmatic consequences of this when not stopping to think about the rights and the liberties that are being afforded by a change in the direction we're going. That is the entire point of the law, to safeguard liberty and to provide for a limited government and the rights of the people and the citizens and corporations. And we should be celebrating laws that do that, even if it might require a little bit of upheaval in the short term to help right previous wrongs. 